afternoon again. Uh, my name is uh, Steve Habers. I'm the CEO of TPA Global. I'm also the CEO of eBright, and this is a joint effort. Um, eBright is a sister company of um, TPA involved in, uh, in e-learning and belt systems and things like that for tech technology specialists. Today, we will uh, talk about uh, the future of tax for tax talents and how the tax digital work spot looks like in, uh, in the future. Um, so those are the two themes of today. Uh, before we start the, the, the presentation, I would like to, um, uh, to do a short introduction. Uh, eBright has published um, three white papers, one on the future of tax, which is called Tax Vision 2025, which gives uh, companies um, a point at the horizon how to organize and, dig and digitally transform their tax workflows and, and gives uh, tips and, and trends analysis and suggestions how to be involved in that uh, process. And the second white paper is on the future of the in-house tax department, which obviously is very interesting if you have the traditional head of tax with VAT corporate income tax, uh, tax accounting, and, and transpising reporting uh, as the direct reports into the head of tax, but with the new generation uh, where a taxologist uh, runs uh, the digital transformation with a tax data engineer, a tax data analyst, and, and uh, very similar roles and responsibilities where the question in that white paper is really thrown on the table, how to merge the, the best of both worlds, uh, how to merge these teams into one operational um, in-house tax team. And, and the last uh, but not least uh, white paper is about the future of tax talent. So we will, uh, the topic we, we will be addressing during uh, today's talk. Um, the, the structure is as follows. I will talk to a couple of slides then it will, uh, um, Mari, who's uh, helping me on this, will open uh, a poll for you to um, uh, share your vote with us so we can immediately look at the results. Um, and that makes the session more interactive uh, from, from any perspective. So please uh, join in if uh, the polls come up. And uh, let's start with the, showing the next slide. Uh, okay, hello, and I also wanted to say, meanwhile, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat and I can make it out. Thank you. Thanks, Mari. So, so the, the first question uh, we, we have addressed in the Future of Tax Talent white paper, and some of you might already have, uh, have read it. Uh, I think there was uh, 150 downloads by now. Uh, is what, what is tax talent about? What are the core and extended competencies you expect the next generation to bring to the in-house tax department? Um, and we define the core competencies of, a, uh, in general, a modernized knowledge worker to be someone with coding and data modeling uh, as at least basic, uh, basic um, knowledge on that good communication skills and project management skills, a good sense of uh, abstract thinking in terms of math and logical thinking in general, and also the agility to learn. I think that's going to be the, the big challenge. If, uh, if, you, if you look at people who start working at the age between 20 and 25, and they, uh, they have to uh, run a couple of careers to get to the age of 60, 65, or these days even uh, even higher, higher age. Um, uh, my expectation is that most modernized knowledge works will run 20 to 30 careers uh, in between that space uh, in, in, the, in the future. So that means the agility to learn is going to be very important um, and well, whenever we think of um, uh, tax uh, talent and uh, if we put it in the context of tax talent could uh, have a background in uh, IT or technology could have a background in finance and could also have a background in tax 
then uh, these are what we consider the extended competencies. So someone with finance would, would need to be exposed to areas like international tax and VAT, but someone with IT might, uh, might be more, uh, uh, more um, savvy to follow financial models and accounting standards while tax people could uh, could be learn more on on the at the level of coding and uh, say the from rpa to ai type of trainings so these are all uh, extended competencies trainings to get people in the area of tax and technology because we believe there's no tax without technology in the future uh, to get them ready for uh, for their tasks and their challenges so this is defining a little bit uh, the, the attributes we expect talents to, uh, to cater for, and that uh, obviously has an impact on what is the background of people and what is the, uh, both from a learning but also an exposure perspective when you uh, want to um, get uh, talents on board. Um, if we move to the next slide, then uh, the, the next question raised in the, the future of tax talent is what, how can employers facilitate uh, the, the working space of uh, tax talent? And, and we have listed a few do's and don'ts. I think there's uh, quite uh, um, an interesting uh, list here to start. Oh, are we first doing the... the no, we're not. Um, no, yeah. yeah, it just popped up. Sorry for that. It was no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. People will already got a peek on the on the poll. Okay. So the the, the do's and the don'ts. If we uh, have uh, the uh, the talents, the do's typically what we get back from the market is start a ta talent academy, so a training academy. Uh, offer a digital work spot, we, which we will talk about a little later. Uh, run a tax data-driven workflow, uh, more and more important. And there's a few other issues, uh, work, private, life balance, uh, bottom-up feedback, uh, fun factor in working in teams. Not so much uh, run a top-down organization, long-term career path. Um, you're not going to work for the same boss in the same job for 20 years anymore, very unlikely. Um, that, that means also limit exposure to a single role in the department is not uh, typically facilitating talent to be attracted to your organization or even segment your organization with no uh, rotation um, and, and introduce a bonus per individual, although that's still happening a lot. I think uh, there's more uh, th there's more the commonalities with which this talent is looking for. Um, we have a poll uh, on on uh, whether you tend to agree on these do's and don'ts. We uh, selected three of them. So, uh, Mari, could you share the poll with us? So now it's up to you to uh, to say whether you agree with our do's and don'ts. Uh, we selected the first three, not necessarily necessarily if we think it's a do, you think it's a do either. So uh, please uh, feel free to uh, fill out. This will take. Um, a few seconds, I believe. Marius, uh, everyone uh, on, the, on the dot, uh, so is the process in place? Yes, okay. uh, people right. have, yes. So I'm quite curious on the, the response. Uh, yes. So start a, um, start a talent academy. That's uh, a whopping 93%. So apparently people seem to justify that, uh, that a talent academy 
is something which really would attract uh, the younger generation. Um, offer a digital work spot, that's already less high, although 73% is still three quarters. So yeah, there's, uh, there's still 30% who doesn't think that is really a differentiator to offer a digital work spot. So that, uh, that is an interesting observation. So still one third of the people do not think that to be an, 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 uh, an attribute and an attraction and run a, a tax data driven workflow. I think uh, certainly the 89 comes close to the 93. So those are indeed, uh, except the offer digital works, but uh, I'm a little bit curious if you have a, uh, on one and three quite high scores, what, what makes people hesitant to, uh, um, to offer the digital work spot, which is an, an integral part almost of on one side the academy and on the other side the uh, tax data driven workflow. Uh, uh, the, the more you uh, make that digital, obviously the more efficient such a workflow is. But uh, this is certainly thanks for the uh, for the input. Uh, this is certainly worth uh, um, the feedback uh, I got from you guys. So uh, thanks for that. So if we if we move to the the next slide, yeah, the the question uh, which comes to our mind is uh, what what is the what is the average age of the works for us we're looking at on in house tax. As we've seen uh, from a couple of um, a couple of surveys uh, have been uh, held, and we've been involved in a few discussions as well. There's quite a big number of uh, of number one and number two heads of tax positions uh, where people don't feel comfortable anymore and either uh, uh, change their careers, so step out of that number one and number two head of tax role. Um, or uh, they actually uh, are on the, on the uh, writing the detail, so um, are waiting for their retirement. And, and I think that the, 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 the way I, I read this and, and also having talked to a couple of uh, heads of tax on this is that uh, the tsunami on one side of uh, anything BAPS, Pillar 1, Pillar 2, and, and, and that changes, uh, including the, the recent Act 7, is throwing at the, the, the heads of tax. And at the same time, this whole digital transformation of tax workflows and data workflows uh, relating to tax is almost uh, a, a, a perfect tsunami, a catch-22, whatever you call it. But that instantly puts a pressure on, uh, on typically the age 45, 65. So not only is it is shrinking, but if the number one and two step out, uh, one, that's a problem because there might not be uh, already a, a smooth transition. Two, it's also an opportunity, especially if you read the, the, the bottom line where it's, it's really generation Y and Z and, and alpha, the, the next is too young for that, but uh, will be making up a majority of the working population uh, by 2030. So really the, the digital native generation we're looking at will step into the shoes of the number one and two. So that is also um, an, um, a relevant factor in how to attract and how to retain talent and uh, what is the typical age uh, uh, the generations you need to look for the talent uh, who will still be there in the year 2030. So we have a poll on that. I believe, Mari? Yes, we do. So basically knowing that, does this influence your recruitment and your retention policy of talent already today? Maybe you were not aware that, that this, this accelerated uh, move, uh, shrinking of uh, the the current generations uh, who are leading the tax role and the uh, in increasing, accelerated increasing importance of the, the next generations is, um, 
is going that fast. So this is uh, all data-driven analysis by a group called Future Proof. It's a group uh, established in, in Holland, headquartered in Holland, which has 200 data analysts which, uh, which investigate uh, these type of demographic trends um, in, the, in the, uh, quite a lot of industries, uh, including ours. Okay, we have the responses. Okay, so uh, yes, people are already taking this into account in the recruitment and retention policy of of, um, of uh, talents today. So I think this is a good almost 80-20. Uh, still 20% is not really catered for this, this change in, in future workforce, which it really is. Uh, so... I think this is also about how not only what is in-house tax going to be doing uh, that other white paper I talked to, I talked about in the beginning, but uh, also if you if you track the talent, uh, is your whole um, your whole recruitment and retention policy uh, uh, focused on 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 that talent pool in Generation Y and Z? Okay, very interesting. Thanks again. Then we move to the next slide. So what, the, what is the competition about in the job market? You always think the, the, that the competition for, in this case, talents who want to work in the crossroad between tax and technology is, uh, is coming from other companies. Um, but the reality is different. The reality is that the, the technology people, and, and this is measured by the jobs posted by non-technology -tech companies and departments in, uh, in the top 12 countries uh, by GDP, uh, has, has significantly gone up. Uh, so if you see the demand in the business areas uh, for technology people, again, by non-technology companies. And the, 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 the increase is, uh, is, is quite staggering on artificial intelligence, on uh, RPA, robotic process automation, but also data scientists and analysts are, are very much in demand. And not, some, not so much uh, dominantly by IT departments, but by other departments in your company. So this is basically means if you, as in-house tax, wants to hire a technology person, someone with a technology background, where you add the tax component uh, to to that that person's background, you're really in, not only in competition with the marketplace, but you're in competition with your commercial department, your marketing department, your finance department. I, I would say, especially your finance department. Uh, for those skills. Uh, so th this is sort of where uh, competition in the market uh, is, uh, is, is starting to happen. And uh, the, the talent pool therefore has a lot of options, therefore making the work spot uh, very attractive is going to be a, a prerequisite to, uh, to, to attract enough of that talent into the in-house tax uh, department. Okay, I think we have a poll on this as well, Mari? Uh, yes, or we do. Yours? So do you agree with my statement while hiring technology trained people? Are you competing with both tech and non-tech companies? And that could be also read as both your IT department and your commercial marketing departments. Uh, so I think you should widen the, the, the statement a little bit, not only to other third-party companies, but also the other departments, your IT department and, and your finance department want to hire the same people as you do. Or are we still believing that tax people are so much different than the, the people and the talent we are trying to, uh, to attract?
I'm quite. Yes, I believe we can. Anxious to. Do... Yes. Okay. That that's a yes of yes. We have a <laughs> or um, so. So yes, I think uh, people better understand these days that if you hire technology people, uh, in the old days you were hiring tax people and there was no competition really who wanted to hire tax people other than the tax department. Uh, that was a rarity. Now you're hiring technology trained people which sometimes have a tax background but often have a finance and a, and a technology background. And suddenly your your competition is, is much different and, and indeed the finance department sitting next door to you might be your competition because they also need these people to facilitate their finance technology and their fintech department uh, with enough technology trained people to uh, to run their processes digitally okay very good um, let's move on to the next slide so this is an interesting one where age analysis is a little bit also a reflection of diversity. So maybe age analysis includes the, the, is, a, is an element of diversity, but we, we build in a reality check. And again, this comes from the white paper, The Future of Tax Talent. So uh, is the average age relevant for the retention of talents? Um, so if you look at the tax authorities in Holland, I think the average age is about my age. Uh, closing in on 60. Uh, how to organize your training and knowledge management for talents? That's another question. Does a once in a year assessment of talents going to be effective or should you more regularly uh, do those assessments uh, to create the, the connectivity? Um, if, if you assume talents expect a new offering in two years, again, two years uh, at times 20 is 40 years of active duty so it's not one time 40 years with the same employer uh, but it's uh, certainly people want to get challenged uh, within a two year period so there's a statement by the head of talent management of microsoft that if you don't give the talents uh, even within microsoft a, a new challenge within two years there's a very low retention rate uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. Uh, but also, uh, do you have a plan B if all your talents indicate to leave within that two years period? Uh, so, so is there an emergency plan almost? Because if all your talent goes, then what are you going to do next in a very competitive market? And how diverse is the in-house tax team already to facilitate uh, diversity of new talents? So, can you hire an econometric guy? Can you hire a Python, uh, an Altrix? Can you hire a tax data analyst or a taxologist? And how does that fit into the culture of the in-house tax department as is today? So this is sort of a first high level age analysis and diversity reality check. So I'm, I'm very interested in uh, if you could bring up the poll in uh, what, uh, what the audience uh, believes and, and feels about this. So a question to you is, is, is your organization future-proof for talent? If you read just, it's not at random, but if you read, read these six questions, do you believe your organization is future-proof? This obviously is a, a big yes and no, and that's probably in all cases, yes, but um, some things need to be improved. So there's always a way to improvement, but uh, multiple choice is uh, unforgiving in this case. It only has a yes and a no. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes. The moment of truth, well, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so 70% does believe uh, they have a future-proof um, environment and uh, organization for talent, uh, while 30% is less happy at this moment, so still room for improvement. But it's a high score. So maybe uh, the, the, the 
event has attracted a, a biased, um, already quite diverse audience. Um, but uh, 70 is pretty high score for for the um, the assessments we've done on uh, on quite some of our clients. Very good. Um, let's move on. So what I want to discuss uh, now is uh, how does a text digital work spot, uh, how could that look like? Because everyone has their own views on that. Uh, but this is a nice visual to, uh, to talk about. And it, it's really putting the knowledge worker, this knowledge worker with core competencies and extended competencies, as we saw on the first slide, in the center of the universe. We say this person has communication and planning tools in the form of Google or Microsoft as, as the two major platforms to do your communication and planning on. Um, although it is set uh, through our cooperation with uh, Vienna University that uh, Microsoft in particular is also pitching the workflows and that especially the product workflows, the production workflows, and the process workflows uh, of, uh, of tax, and is investigating quite some time and development time and, uh, and trials on. Um, then we have, uh, the, just as an illustration of production automation or product automation through TPG, which is just one of the transfer pricing report writing tools so it produces transfer pricing reports and you can replicate them to next year you can uh, basically connect uh, the transactions with uh, functional functional write-ups and it's all happening in a digital space you can auto generate and company agreements uh, the same way you generate local files master files you can even load your CBCR, convert it into an XML and, and share it through the same platform with the tax authority. So that's typically a produ product or production automation. Then uh, we have the compliance tracker and dashboard. So compliance tracker is, is really tracking the progress on all of your compliance needs. In, in the case of transfer pricing, you would be looking at um, the master file, local file, CBCR, but also the local form. So you would have a production calendar of, uh, say, at least 40 uh, to 140 deliverables in a 12 months window. And you need a compliance tracker uh, rather or, and or a dashboard rather than a email communication on the planning of, of those deliverables uh, with your other knowledge workers and the organization you work in. So that's typically um, a process automation uh, tool. And then uh, we, we don't want to go back in each, each new career uh, to the university where we get trained in six months or even uh, six years to, to get the next um, attributes uh, of knowledge uh, for our next career, but we want the knowledge to be much closer integrated in the workflows we, uh, we, we, are, we are involved in. So this digital intelligent agent could feed uh, whether you need to wear uh, VR spectacles or you have uh, a lens in your eye which projects the knowledge you, you are asking for at that moment, there's all sorts of uh, uh, techniques which are being developed uh, by the tech giants in particular to get that knowledge uh, uh, very close by and very, uh, very flexible in terms of pulling up the relevant knowledge you need at that point in time. You're doing a production or you're, doing a, uh, you're running a process. So this is, this is sort of a base version of what people need to think about and, and visualize to get to the next level of, uh, of, of uh, uh, text digital work spots for uh, talent. And not only for talent, but for the whole in-house text department. So I think we have a poll here as well, or not? Uh, yes, we do have a poll for this slide as well.
So what is for you the number one feature of the tax digital work uh, spot? And there's only one, one choice. Are you most interested in, uh, in, a, in one of the first four or do you say it's, it's all of the above? Um, we, we know currently that the, the, whole, the whole way in-house tax departments are configuring uh, their work spots um, is not all, always running through a single sign-on with a dashboard or a compliance tracker, but there's quite a few different software packages where different logins are required. Uh, you go into SAP, you, you get the data into a tax data lake, you get to select the data and uh, move it to uh, a, a next uh, uh, a next level of um, um, a next level of uh, completing your VAT return. Yes, and we. Yes, and we have the results back. Okay, so process platforms are popular and all of the above is the majority, but yeah, it's a 60-40. So process platforms uh, is what people expect. And I, I can imagine that's, that's a relevant statement because if you have a very structured process um, where each step is being predefined and who's doing what and and that's fully automated and you get sort of all of the above in, included almost so i i understand the answer to this question so but very interesting thank you very much then we could uh, yeah i i just built one uh end to uh, end to automation we're currently involved in ourselves where if you, and this is called end-to-end -end for the reasons that we have data from a system and we have a digital filing with the tax authorities of the relevant pieces of financial data or um, just reports uh, relevant for uh, the tax authority. So that's, that's what defines the end-to-end. -end. Uh, we take the data uh, from the financial system. We apply with Python the filters. The filters are used in this particular case to see um, whether individual intercompany transactions are above a threshold uh, or whether the entities um, are involved in uh, a value of intercompany transactions which is above a threshold or whether the, the uh, the sales line of the, the group as a whole is above a certain threshold. So there's about 10 thresholds uh, across the world which define if you're above the threshold, uh, you're obliged to uh, produce a transfer pricing document. So basically the data in combination with uh, Python uh, being smart enough to put it through the filters creates a, a very customized production calendar. Uh, production calendar for master files and notifications on master files, local files, and uh, CBCR filings. But uh, even more important these days, the the whole uh, oil and water of uh, TP forms, which uh, seems to be never ending. So there's a lot of forms thrown at uh, tax uh, payers these days. And mind you, these uh, forms. Um, although they might be just two questions or a one pager, if there's, there's quite a severe consequence if you don't file them on time or not complete or you leave certain cells open. Because in most countries, they're used as an, a trigger for transfer pricing audits. Uh, so be aware that that's very important. But say you have a production calendar and you need to produce 100 
uh, uh, documents across the world, how are you going to track it? How are you going to load uh, that production calendar um, in, in this particular case through a macro in the, in the compliance tracker? And this particular compliance tracker, and there's, there's a few versions out in the market and we, we use one of, uh, of, the, of those versions. It basically takes the, the, the 100 uh, documents to be produced. It allocates the documents to, uh, the, through a RACI con a concept. So the R to the ones who produce the document, the A who's signing off, the C who's consulted, and the I who needs to be informed about the status. It, it allows you to do uh, capacity planning. Um, if someone has 40 documents on their desk and they go on holidays for three months, then obviously you need to reallocate those 40 to uh, the rest of the team. Well, that can happen in a few clicks. So here we, we have a combination in the compliance tracker between um, the process automation and communication. So that's the, the combination this, uh, this digital step entails. Uh, once you have this in place, you eliminate the need for email communication. As we all know, out of the 100 emails you get or you send, uh, five of them get lost at the receiving end. Well, if five of them get lost and they're all about deadlines around compliance, then obviously your, um, your compliance process is not watertight. This compliance tracker therefore tracks these uh, four outputs as we see them at uh, below the compliance tracker. And uh, once that, uh, that uh, uh, schedule is connected to the production tool, and the production tool is this TPG I was talking about, uh, and, and uh, gives uh, signals when TPG needs has completed, it automatically tracks and uh, indicates in the compliance tracker that uh, the circle is closed, at least the internal circle is closed, because the last step and not the least step is uh, that more and more um, uh, documents not only need to be prepared and ready upon an audit or upon a request by the tax authorities, but more and more documents need to be filed in a digital portal and the digital portal uh, has a, a different levels of, uh, of uh, uh, checks. Now, some portals, they check the completeness of the data. Uh, some even uh, at the level of the tax authorities, they check the validity of the data and cross-reference it to other sources or to the, the previous VAT return or transfer pricing form or corporate income tax return. Uh, filed. Uh, I think if you if you look, for example, to the uh, the SAT in China has a whole algorithm where if you file the the transfer pricing forms, uh, you could actually receive an uh, an IDR an information data request on deltas. The algorithm picked up, uh, so you get not only a signal back, but you get a whole analysis of what they believe needs further clarification. So it's almost like a a digital audit lands upon you five hours after you filed your uh, you digitally filed your transfer pricing uh, forms in this particular case. So what we see happening here is um, a normal cycle from data to digital filing with tax authorities uh, in the area of transfer pricing, uh, which I'm quite familiar with, is between four and 18 months. And uh, the automation process which we're running today brings it back to less than two months. Uh, so basically, you're not only uh, uh, tightening the leakages, and, and especially in the communication and the processes run, but you're also shortening uh, the, the conversion from data to end products in, uh, in the, with, with these uh, Python with filters, compliance tracker, and TPG production process. Where I uh, TPG has a filing, a digital filing option for country by country, uh, but it doesn't have a, a filing option for some of the other reports. So you would need to uh, interpose another 
dashboard, which um, I call the next generation of uh, digital filing agents uh, who can actually bring your document um, and file it on your behalf with the, the, the tax authorities digital platform. So before we go to the polls, uh, Mari, is there any questions at this stage? No, there is no questions yet. Okay, then let's go to the poll of this one. So the question is, what are the challenges to establish this tax digital work spot for transfer pricing? And I think you should read F, G, H, and so on as A, B, C. That's our mistake. Um, what what we um, what we have changed as well is not only the automation of some of uh, of the processes you see on this slide, but we also changed the way we uh, produce the whole the whole um, uh, TP forms for the whole world. And so we start with benchmarks. We have frozen blocks which per transaction describe exactly what happens. Then we feed the intercompany transactional matrix we get from our clients and the segmented PLs as the missing elements, and then we're done with the TP documentation because all of the rest is pretty much automated. Uh, so it's a very efficient process going forward. Obviously, it depends a little bit on how efficient data flows are within the multinational. Yes, and we have the results. Okay, so I think uh, this is an audience to my heart. Uh, qualified people, processes, and technology using data as a strategic asset uh, uh, is, is sort of my ideal answer, which uh, basically tells me all of the above, and that's what 64%, I think, uh, very important. It's very interesting, data as a strategic asset also has a good 20%, almost 20% of the score. Qualified technology, yes. Uh, ISO certif certified, yes. Qualified processes uh, doesn't have a score. I think I understand that because if you, if you have a 150 pages manual how to fill out the corporate, the, the country by country report, which is issued by the OECD, as sort of a qualified process, then you don't need per se that qualified process because that's pre-described by the tax authorities. Yet you need to weave, uh, weave this into your solution. Um, and, and that is typically done in the case of CBCR, country by country reporting by running outlier analysis and uh, do a risk analysis on this. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yes, before we move on, we have uh, two questions raised. Uh, okay, go ahead, uh, uh, Yes, so um, Hendrik asks us, many jurisdictions use TET accounts as a basis for the corporate tax returns. Yeah. Does this streamlining also require close cooperation and integration with the accounting function? And also, is the idea that this return process will be integrated with the provisioning? Um, yeah, the provisioning. Uh, yeah, if if you uh, if you look at uh, automation, end-to-end -end automation in direct taxes, uh, Hendrik, then uh, the approach we see or one of the projects where we have developed a, a reporting tax packs for a multinational where we did uh, enrich the data um, for that tax pack to be uh, collected to also cater for the public CPCR. Uh, that means I, I have another deliverable there uh, next to the provisioning the tax packs typically do. Uh, and then I data enrich again that tax pack to also cater for my pillar uh, two calculations and reporting. Uh, that almost in, in, in automating that process and we're, we're running with a few of our clients a soft close on, on, on the, such a cycle, including a soft close on pillar two 
already is is creating a direct tax reporting standard under either IFRS or US GAAP. Uh, I would say that the the gap between that and local stat and and local tax books uh, has not been fully automated, except a few parties um, uh, in the market who have been doing that, but they're mostly US centric. So Tax Technology Inc. is is one of them, a spin-off of Deloitte, and they, they're very successful in doing that full reconciliation uh, to tax returns, mostly to US tax forms, but also they're expanding that uh, whole automation into uh, corporate income tax returns outside the US territory. So, so yes, it's happening, but it's not there yet, I would say, in terms of full automation. So end-to-end would be overstating uh, the, 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 the today's world. Okay. Okay, and uh, we have second question as well. Uh, is it normal to expect all of the core and extended competencies in a single individual going forward? Uh, the core, yes. I think uh, modernized knowledge workers need to assume that uh, each uh, employer, each project, each task uh, requires that sort of basic and core competencies. Uh, the extended competencies also um, have to do with what uh, what tasks and and what uh, the twenty careers you're you're envisioning if you start uh, at the age of twenty twenty five with a corporate uh, then you have twenty cycles if if you, your only cycles are technology driven then maybe that whole tax scene is is less relevant and therefore. Uh, you might take, and um, I think we, we address that in the, in the next slide as well, you may, may take a base uh, exposure to, um, to some of the international tax and VAT trainings, but you don't need an extended competencies in, in terms of a full-blown course on those matters. Uh, so it, it depends a little bit on your career choices or your choices for certain projects and stay away from other projects. Um, I think a lot of people will drive their own career by picking the extended competencies they feel very happy about and want to work in. So I hope that sort of addresses these two questions. Uh, so thanks for, uh, for raising them. If there's any, any other questions, please feel free. What, what you've seen here is we addressed the communication uh, part around the knowledge worker, the process of automation and production automation. What we have not addressed in this, and that is part of the question we, we, we just got on the, the core and extended competencies um, that's not on this slide, so we need to move to the next slide to also address that. So if you have, if you're the knowledge worker on the, the top left, then you might have a dynamic dashboard, which gives you access to process flows, data, products, geographies, use cases, and taxes. Um, and it also, through that dashboard, gives you uh, access to the belt system. Uh, and the belt system, uh, this is the belt system uh, as developed by eBright and close cooperation with uh, Vienna University, uh, with Robert Ries and, his, uh, and, and uh, Jeffrey Owens with their tax technology um, center out of, uh, out of Vienna. Um, it starts with a, a yellow belt where the yellow belt is all about taxonomy. So if you have people with an IT technology or tax background, you want them to all talk the same language. Orange belt gets you exposed to case studies. Light green belt to the first use cases, but also a variety of what's the taxpayers' uh, rights in, in a global digital economy. And dark green belt really gets you into the use cases uh, ex exposure, where black belt obviously is the superior um, role uh, where uh, the, the whole um, trainer trainer concepts comes, comes into play. 
So quite a few corporates have uh, already chosen to uh, go into this process uh, to just get their in-house tax team uh, uh, very much uh, digital savvy, but also if they have uh, people from finance and technology, they can cater for, through the belt system, they can cater for a better understanding of uh, the, the whole tax background and context in which technology is being used. As you see on the left, there are some basic tax technology and finance courses. That's what the TTF stands for. So uh, eBright is, uh, is in the next uh, year going to share basic courses on Udemy on transferizing tax technology valuation and, and value chain analysis. And together with Vienna uh, Phoenix IT Academy and a few others, uh, they are also offering advanced uh, tax technology and finance courses in addition to the belt system. So this is sort of uh, an e-learning platform which uh, can easily be connected to uh, your dashboard while working on uh, the various workflows in, in tax. So this is, uh, I think, where where we uh, we end the the, the uh, presentation. But we have one more poll to go. I think. Yes, we have poll for this uh, part as well. Yeah, that's the frequency you organize training and knowledge management. Huh? There's, there's the, the classical way you get together once a year, um, maybe daily or each second you need information, you pull it up. This, uh, this may be the way you feel knowledge management in, in such a tax digital workspace needs to play a role. So I'm curious about uh, your vote. Okay, we have the results. Okay, monthly training is still uh, the, the, the primary way to get knowledge into the head of the knowledge workers. Um, only 13% believes a daily feed is and, and, and digital feed of knowledge is, is going to be the, the future or today's reality already because we asked them how do you organize training today so that's that's interesting yeah my view of the future is there will be much more integrated uh, uh, knowledge into the workflows therefore pulling knowledge uh, while you're working on a case will become much more standard in, uh, in tomorrow's world than, than it is today but certainly already uh, um, and people and, and corporates are working on that for the right reason. Uh, so you don't want to go back each uh, of the 20 careers to school um, um, on, and to be, be trained on a monthly or even six monthly or yearly base. There's no yearly in here, which is uh, promising. So everyone is already on the move. Okay, with that, is there any final questions from the audience? Is cautious of time? Uh, there is not a question raised in the chat. Okay, then maybe we can take one peek on the yes. slides, which is following. So this we is a, uh, a, a what we call an ETL table, uh, which makes part of this end-to-end -end automation process for transfer pricing. So on the left side, you see the information the finance department typically extracts uh, to facilitate the tax department. Uh, transformation and cleaning up data, either Python, Abidia, there's a few tools there out to get to clean data. The clean data uh, is kept in metadata and warehouses, tax data warehouses uh, in particular. And then you see on the right side, you see the, uh, the load leads to a different uh, uh, user audience where analysis reporting and process data mining or even process mining will become the standard into the future. This 
uh, these use cases are all in the uh, use cases archive, uh, an open source platform to take a look at because it's not only use cases on transfer pricing, but also on VAT, uh, even use cases uh, used by governments um, on the eBright platform. And you can also look at the global tax technology community page of eBright who uh, carries this. So this is, uh, this is in short what we wanted to discuss today. We also have a quick uh, one poll left for this slide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Should we do this? Yeah. Meanwhile, you can. So, how does data changes the tax digital work spot configuration? Yeah, sorry about the EFGH. Something with our alphabet was not uh, not perfect, so we'll restore that next time. Okay. Yes, we Closing have the in. results. Okay, that's. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think that's uh, after showing this slide. That's probably the only answer you want to hear. So. Uh, Thanks very much for uh, to everyone. Uh, we will be holding uh, more of these uh, also together with uh, Vienna University. We're uh, uh, we're going to launch uh, uh, tax tech talks um, in the in the coming weeks. So please stay tuned and uh, be watching out for new events uh, on our social media and on our website. And thank you very much and enjoy your evening. <laughs>